Institute's patients. And then I, I just want to begin by some short acknowledgments after Joe's talk that I couldn't do anything that I've been doing without all of the members of my lab who have helped facilitate, design, create, do everything that I, my name is on. So, uh, and they're here, uh, so I want to thank them. And um, also to the members of the, other members of the proxome disease community where I wouldn't be where I was without the um, collegiality of everyone and the ability of all of us to work together, which is really great. And then to all of the new members, you know, again, welcome, as Joe says. So the purpose of my talk is um, really to give a medical overview of proxism biogenesis disorders, so everybody is on the same page here, and to sort of remind us of some of these basic concepts as we move along. And I'm going to just go through a childhood presentation, a little bit of the molecular and the biochemistry, which will be followed up in detail by others. And uh, we, uh, Polte, from the Netherlands uh, will uh, give you some more details about the adult presentations, which are much milder uh, and probably more amenable to therapy. So with that, um, I'm going to begin by giving you a little background, a little history of these disorders. So they were first described by a uh, biochemist in Belgium called Christian de Duve, uh, uh, the uh, proxosomes as organelles. And then about 10 years later, a neurologist in the Midwestern United States by the name of Hans Zellweger um, described a dysmorphology syndrome in which he found a number of infants that he was seeing had a similar facial features and similar organ uh, and tissue involvements. And he called it the cerebrohepatorenal syndrome because those were the main uh, organs that were involved. And it also became known as Zellweger syndrome. And then another 10 years later, um, a um, pathologist at, uh, um, in uh, the Bronx uh, in New York City uh, recognized that the proxosome uh, organelles were abnormal in uh, kidney and liver tissues uh, from patients with Zellweger syndrome. But this wasn't really put together till another 10 years later when uh, it was known with the development of lipid biochemistry techniques and uh, we began to know what the paroxysomes did enzymatically, that we could tie the abnormal paroxysomes together with the disease of Zellweger syndrome. So it became a paradigm for a metabolic malformation syndrome. So a, a set of malformations caused by a, um, a combination of enzyme deficiencies. And then uh, in the late 1980s, uh, cells from these patients were collected and complemented, and um, Hugo Moser had a, with Ann Moser had a large bank of cells, uh, and we began to learn that um, through the complementation studies that there was clearly genetic heterogeneity, so there were more than one gene that was defective in these disorders. And then after that, uh, with many persons involved, uh, cell biologists and, and physicians uh, and, and clinician scientists, uh, Proxism biogenesis genes were identified first in yeast, and then the human genes were identified by yeast homology. And then uh, uh, in this uh, um, uh, century, we've been looking at the study of protein functions, pathophysiology, their applications to management and therapy, and then of course with next generation sequencing, all of these novel phenotypes are now being recognized. We kind of have to I have to reorientate uh, our, our head around what proxosome biogenesis disorders exactly are. So uh, starting with the properties of proxosomes at the cellular level, this image is um, uh, cells from uh, uh, human uh, skin cells that are cultured, uh, made into fibroblast, fibroblast cultures in the laboratory, and then fixed and permeabilized and um, uh, hybridized with the antibody either to the proxosomal membrane or to a matrix enzyme inside. And what you can see is that they are um, spherical organelles, they're small, there's about 100 or more than 100 per cell. And they're known to be flexible and dynamic organelles that proliferate and regulate their enzyme composition according to metabolic cues that we really don't know what those are uh, even at this time. And then what we've learned recently is that uh, proxosomes are not all created equally in different tissues. Uh, so I'm just bringing out these authors here. Kevin Lorenzi is sitting in the audience from uh, um, Amsterdam, who recently showed that in the uh, PEX1G843D mouse, where we know there's residual proxosome functions and it represents a milder disease, there's no proxosomes in the liver. Uh, and um, uh, Marion Bias has shown recently that when you take a look at proxosomal functions in retina, you have uh, different enzymatic uh, 
uh, combinations at different levels of the retina. So this is what I mean by saying um, peroxisomes are not equal in all tissues. In our lab, Wade at Falata has shown in the PEC7 mouse model that uh, PEC7 is present in only certain cells of the brain and not in others. So that's interesting. And um, for uh, the enzymatic constitution of, of peroxisomes, there's um, uh, more than 50 enzymes, but there's uh, certain pathways that have been well characterized and have been used for diagnosis. And these include um, fatty acid beta oxidation, uh, very long chain fatty acids, which are defined as carbon chains greater than C22, and the peroxisome catabolizes saturated, unsaturated, dicarboxylic, and methyl branched uh, fatty acids. And this catabolism also involves a synthesis of two compounds. One are the C24 bile acids, which undergo one step of beta oxidation from their uh, C27 precursors. And also, uh, similarly, docohexanoic acid, which is a um, C22 polyunsaturated omega-3 fatty acid that's important in retinal and brain function. Peroxisomes are also important in the synthesis of a uh, major class of membrane phospholipids called ether glycerol phospholipids that we still don't have a good understanding of what their functions are, although they're present in, uh, as 20% of the glycerol phospholipid fraction in all cell membranes and close to 90 or 100% in specialized membranes like myelin. Peroxisomes are also involved in the uh, detoxification of amino acids, including alanine and glycine that go through glyoxylate. Uh, and they're also involved, uh, and we're learning more about now, uh, the regulation of the redox state of the cell because they produce and consume reactive oxygen species, mainly by their initial oxidase step in beta oxidation that generates peroxide, which is how peroxisomes got their name, and is detoxified by a peroxisomal enzyme catalase. And so you can imagine if the peroxisome doesn't work well, you're going to build, you're going to accumulate very long chain fatty acids because they're not going to be broken down. And you're going to get a deficiency of your uh, primary bile acids, but a buildup of the intermediary C27 bile acids. You'll have a deficiency of docohexanoic acid, a deficiency of plasmalogens, a buildup of, uh, of um, calcium oxalate, which uh, um, deposits in the kidney and forms stones. And then this, we don't really have a handle of how this might be disease causing. Yeah. So um, moving now to uh, the uh, PEX genes and their protein functions. This is just a diagram uh, that uh, Catherine Argirio, who's a member of my lab, put together for a review article. And um, it shows you the PEX proteins that are involved in enzyme import and the PEX proteins that are involved in new membrane formation and division of existing peroxisomes. And just to go briefly through this, you have receptors in the cytoplasm that are PEX5 and PEX7, and they uh, recognize enzymes that are destined for the peroxisomal matrix by virtue of their targeting signals. And then the complex of PEX5 and PEX7 with their enzymes uh, um, translocates to the peroxisomal membrane where it binds to PEX 13 and 14. 14 forms a, um, a, a dynamic hole in the membrane, and then you have a, a translocation of the enzymes inside. And then you have uh, PEX 5 being monoubiquinated by this complex 2, 10, and 12. And then you have this uh, complex here on the right, which is called the exportomer complex is PEX1 and 6, which is attached to the peroxisomal membrane by PEX26. 1 and 6 are AAA ATPases. And uh, the, um, hydrolysis, the energy in the hydrolysis of ATP is used to actually move this complex uh, to uh, pull PEX5 and presumably PEX7 out of the membrane and recycle it for another round. And then here, uh, when I first entered this field, we believed that all peroxisomes uh, came from division of pre-existing peroxisomes, and it was soon clear that new membrane material was coming off all the time from the endoplasmic reticulum. And then very recently, we found out that um, peroxisomal uh, membranes also receive a contribution from the mitochondrial membranes as well. So there it seems to be a, a lot of coordination between organelles in the cell, and this is a more complicated process than we originally thought.
And then you have uh, PEX11, which is involved in, 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 in fission, along with uh, mitochondrial proteins that are involved in a mitochondrial fission. So you have shared proteins here between the proxosome and the mitochondria. And the bottom line is biallelic mutations uh, or ortosomal recessive mutations in any one of 13 PEX genes can cause these disorders. And I hope that um, I've uh, given you the picture that you're going to end up uh, with uh, a PEX gene defect with reduced peroxisome numbers, with failure to import enzymes, with therefore multiple enzyme deficiencies, an accumulation of toxic metabolites or deficiency of required uh, compounds, and, but still the pathophysiology is still not clear. And the end result clinically is complex developmental and multi-system progressive disorders with various degrees of severity that depends on the residual PEX protein functions. So um, what we've also uh, tried to do, recognizing this, um, uh, this background of uh, cell biology and physiology and, and molecular uh, aspects, uh, um, as a community decided to change these disease names. <coughs> the prior nomenclature was Zellweger syndrome for the most severe form that the neurologist Hans, El Hans Zellweger recognized in infants. And then there were other forms described by clinical features that these children presented with. And maybe a more intermediate form that developed a leukodystrophy called neonatal adrenal leukodystrophy. A milder form that kind of looked like the adult form of Refson's disease. And then recently with next generation sequencing, a very mild form of this disorder with uh, preservation of intellect called Heimler syndrome. And really uh, through the uh, physicians and family associations, the um, uh, choice is to change the nomenclature to Zellweger spectrum disorder with a severe intermediate and milder presentations because, because this is inclusive of the common paroxysome etiology, the fact that patients are individuals on a spectrum and don't necessarily fit a, fit a specific category. And uh, uh, it also inc is inclusive of the expanded and novel phenotypes being reported that I'll show you. And also, uh, uh, according to the families, for things uh, they felt were changing phenotypes. So when they were told their child seemed mild initially and then developed, for example, a leukodystrophy and then was reclassified as severe. So uh, for these reasons, uh, we think that a better term is cell lacquer spectrum. So this is what the severe Zellweger spectrum disorder looks like. This is the original Zellweger syndrome. And um, you can see uh, how he was able to recognize some commonalities. So you have this uh, tall forehead. You have a wide anterior fontanelle, which is a soft spot. You can kind of see that here in this child. You have a wide space between the eyes. You have a depression of the uh, nasal bridge. Um, you have an upturned nose. Uh, uh, you have a very floppy infant, uh, and that's why most of them are too fed because they don't even have good, good swallowing muscles. You have these single transverse palmar creases, and then, of course, this child is drawn, jaundiced here because of neonatal cholestasis or liver involvement. So these kids can be recognized by a dysmorphologist as having similar features. And usually the clinician can recognize this disorder and diagnose it clinically, and we get called to the neonatal intensive care unit for seizures in a neonate usually. And what we see when we examine the infant is very, very floppy. Uh, and if we take a look at the brain MRI, we see these classical architectural abnormalities described in the syndrome, which is regional, regional pachygyria, or um, too few and enlarged folds of the brain and polymicrogyria in other areas, which is multiple small folds, and then these German, germinal and cysts. And then if we examine the infant, we will also see, in addition to the facial features, the tall forehead, et cetera, that I had mentioned, uh, we uh, find that the liver is enlarged, and we see these um, abnormal liver function tests. If we take a look at the bile acids, which is really a proxosomal function test because the proxosomes metabolize the C27 to the C24 bile acids, we'll see elevated C27 bile acids. We do an ultrasound of the liver, we see subcortical cysts uh, in the kidney. I'm sorry, ultrasound of the kidney. Uh, and if we do some skeletal x-rays, we actually see these punctate calcifications uh, in these patients, usually limited to the hips and knees.
And then we go ahead and we'll do some more proxosomal functions and find out they're abnormal and a gene panel to determine what the underlying gene defect is. And uh, this will be the, again, cerebrohepatorenal syndrome of Zellweger. And again, you, for the, for the uh, common manifestations, which is the brain, cerebro, and the liver, hepato, and then the renal cysts. So uh, I also want to point out that there are single enzyme defects or single protein defects, uh, or, which are defects in those enzymes that are in the peroxisome, and these have overlapping clinical features. So this is one of the reasons it's good to get, take a look at peroxisome metabolites and to do the gene testing. Um, and uh, it also helps us understand these diseases better, that you can actually have some single enzymes efficiencies in which the uh, patients have many overlapping features with the biogenesis disorders. And this goes all the way from the severe to the mild forms of the disease. And it includes um, uh, a novel transporter, ACBD5. It includes some features of even X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy with the leukodystrophy part. ABCD3 defects uh, can cause severe liver disease. Amicar can also cause liver and uh, CNS disease. And again, with all of these, we have parts of this uh, biogenesis spectrum. So this is intermediate to milder form, and I think here the role of newborn screening, which has started in the United States, will really help pick up a lot of these kids um, pre-symptomatically, because they often are not recognized at birth. And if we can pick these kids up who have a milder disease pre-symptomatically, then we have a better chance of having a therapy that uh, will actually help, in, help improve their clinical uh, disease. And we defined uh, these intermediate and milder group as the absence of major malformations that define the severe ZSDs, the absence of the brain malformations, the absence of uh, the renal cysts, the absence of the chondrodysplasia punctata. And I think um, uh, Dr. LaPiana from McGill helped review about 60 MRIs that we had on these children, and there actually are some uh, changes to this part right now, and I'll, I'll let her uh, speak to us about that. But in general, the intermediate and milder children are, um, are uh, free of the major malformations that define cell virus syndrome and have a progressive disease over time that if we could recognize and intervene early might be the ideal therapeutic candidates. And so their baseline involvement it is cerebral. So we're going to go through cerebral and hepatic. Uh, so they have a, a neurocognitive uh, abnormalities uh, and a progressive. This includes, I include in cerebral just to, as a way of thinking about it, the progressive retinal degeneration and sensory neural hearing loss, some degree of liver dysfunction. And then they have, interestingly, ameliogenesis imperfecta, which is absence of enamel on the secondary teeth. We have, don't have a clue of how that biology or pathophysiology works uh, from proxosome metabolism to teeth. Uh, that would be interesting to figure out. Um, this is the even milder form, so now we're getting to preservation of intellect or normal intellect. Again, their disease, this disease is really a progressive uh, hearing and vision loss, again, with the ameliogenesis imperfecta. And um, the, on top of this sort of baseline disease are complications, and one of the big problems in this field is trying to figure out prognostically who gets what complications and when, because we need to define some accurate clinical endpoints for therapy. And these complications include uh, leukodystrophy, which is uh, demyelinating, uh, and um, seizure disorders, the development of peripheral neuropathy. Although liver disease is present in most patients, the big question is who's going to develop more severe liver disease than others? And so we, can, we see a, um, oops, we see a, a can see a progression of fibrosis and cirrhosis that leads to portal hypertension and esophageal var varices, and in the end, in young adults, we're now seeing um, adenocarcinoma. And uh, then uh, some patients will develop uh, renal stones that can lead to hypertension and renal failure. Uh, some patients develop adrenal insufficiency, and some patients develop osteopenia. But again, uh, just again putting in perspective for everyone so we can all remember, it's still a cerebral, including sensory and neurological, hepatic, renal, and now I've sort of added adrenal and bone to this multi-system disease. So this is just an example of leukodystrophy, which we'll hear more about from Dr. LaPiana. And so this gives you an example, again, of the variation even in this demyelinating process. Uh, so um, 
we have this boy who was diagnosed at nine months of age, developed a leukodystrophy after his diagnosis, and died fairly uh, soon after that uh, with a loss of all of his milestones. And then this little girl was diagnosed with her leukodystrophy, but lived for a much longer time, for nearly 14 years, uh, in which she regained some milestones and was able to have to function. And this shows you that there is um, you know, interfamilial variability. So this is her sister, who was diagnosed um, later uh, and um, had a brain MRI, show, show, just showed nonspecific white matter changes. So she never developed a leukodystrophy. So clearly, these, these, these additional complications have modifiers with them that we need to figure out. So this, now I'm going to move on to emerging phenotypes, or uh, this, these other phenotypes that we're seeing as we learn more about proxism biogenesis disorders. And um, one of the ways I've classified them is they're atypical, so they're not, they don't really uh, have a sensory, sensory losses, like hearing and vision, and they have preservation of intellect. So that's what makes them uh, um, atypical. And so here's an example. Here's a five-year-old boy who presented with an unsteady gait here. And he had a normal brain MRI, normal liver functions, normal hearing and vision, and he had normal teeth. So he goes against sort of our baseline categorization of this disorder. But he did develop the renal stones. He did develop a peripheral neuropathy. And the progression of his peripheral neuropathy eventually led to death. And um, this, the, this type of picture usually presents what we're in with certain mutations in PEX 2, 10, and 12. And in general, as more of these patients are emerging, it's preservation of intellect with a peripheral neuropathy, cerebellar atrophy, and sensory neural hearing loss in this category. And then here's another example of, a, of atypical a phenotype, preservation of intellect. And so these uh, group of patients uh, present with normal hearing and vision, normal liver functions, normal teeth, but they develop a spastic paraparesis and dystonia with a leukodystrophy, and they can also have juvenile cataracts. And these two children are affected in this family, and these are due to PEX-16 defects. And I just want to point out that we have um, looked at a, a clinically and um, molecularly uh, characterized a large population of these patients. And uh, Anthony Chung has done that in my lab, and he has a poster for you to see if you're interested. So uh, this was put together by Femti. Femke Kluwer, who is part of the Amsterdam group, and it's really a nice uh, diagram of uh, how we relate these disease severity to the uh, symptoms the patient has. And basically, the neonatal presentation is the most severe, and so you'll have the malformations here, and you'll have um, um, the um, many complications, uh, and in the end, this will cause an early demise. And then you have these child and adolescent uh, presentations, and the difference is, is in the intermediate group, you have more complications that develop earlier and progress more rapidly. And in this adult and adolescent group, or uh, adult and adolescent onset, or adult and adolescent diagnosis, you really have minimal symptoms that progress very slowly. So the severity of uh, Zellweger spectrum disorders also correlates to proxal number, size, and function, which is kind of nice, because it's a way to wrap our heads around this. And so the, oops, I keep doing that. So the uh, top panel, again, these are skin fibroblasts. The top fat panel is um, hybridized with a proximal memory marker, so you see proximal numbers and size. In the bottom, we have a marker for matrix protein import, so you can see how well those proximals function. And in the control cell lines, all of the red dots have a corresponding green dot, and that means all of the proxosomes are actually importing this matrix enzyme. And in the severe form, you have very few proxosomes. I think you can see in there enlarged because they're not dividing well. And uh, not every red dot has a green dot, so some of those proxosomal membranes are not even importing. And the historical term for that was proxosomal ghosts in these patients. And in the milder patients, you have more proxosomes, but they're still not the normal number, and they're still enlarged, but many more of them are importing. And so this is what we see at a cellular level in fibroblasts. Um, let's and um, again, uh, if we take a look at proxosomal metabolites, like very long-chain fatty acids and plasmalogens, in the severe disease, we have the most um, abnormal levels, the highest very long chain fatty acids, lowest plasmalogens. And as you get to milder patients, these can even be normal in blood, making the diagnosis a bit more complicated. 
And so if we just uh, go quickly through gene mutations and, and phenotype here, um, as um, Joe had mentioned, um, there are um, most common alleles are in the PEX1 group and uh, in North America, this is due to founder effects. One of them is the PEX1 G843D, which represents 30% of all alleles in patients of Northern European ancestry. Uh, so that includes North America and Australia and Europe. And then we have uh, a, uh, also a um, frame shift allele that represents 20% of all alleles, which brings 50% of all alleles, just these two PEX1. And we, so we have enough of these patients that we see over and over again that we can say that if you're homozygous for this allele, you are in the milder category generally, uh, and um, although it's not absolute. And this allele has residual function. And if you have this allele, it is predicted to be null. There's no RNA associated with it. And its homozygosity predicts a severe phenotype. And we have enough patients now that have one G843D and one I700 frame shift to state that this really predicts at least an intermediate phenotype. And then I haven't spoken about PEX7, and I know there's people in the audience who are interested in PEX7. So uh, uh, for PEX7, 50% of all alleles are this nonsense mutation, and homozygosity pr predicts the most severe phenotype. And clearly, though, there are other molecular mechanisms that lead to milder phenotypes, and uh, this has been um, outlined by uh, um, the uh, Dutch group uh, uh, for, two to, for two sets of alleles. And uh, then, uh, just to go quickly through RCDP, these are represented by uh, defects in PEX7, so just one of the, one of the PEX genes. Uh, and um, it's caused by a plasmalogen deficiency. There's a limited number of biochemical abnormalities in this disorder. And um, the one that causes this disease, we have uh, targeted in on, and it is plasmalogens. And uh, so, I think there's something wrong with this. Just by, by the way, um, so here you have the most, this is a spectrum also, and so here you have the most severe form, and uh, so these children have congenital cataracts. Um, the name rhizomelic chondrodysplasia punctatus for rhizomelia or shortening of the upper arms that you can see on the x-ray here. Uh, they also have the skeletal dysplasia where there's punctate calcifications in the growth plates, and you can sort of see that in each one of the, uh, of the joints. Um, and um, they, this causes a severe growth deficiency or dwarfism. They have profound developmental delays as plasmalogens are important uh, membrane phospholipids uh, and represent, as I mentioned before, up to 100% in myelin. And um, uh, they also have a high incidence of cardiac defects. And, but you can get children with milder forms and they uh, have more, um, less of the skeletal dysplasia, better growth and better development. Um, and then just to point out here about um, RCDP, so here's you know, a defect in PEX7. Uh, when, when that happens, uh, the enzymes targeted by PEX7 to the proxosome can't reach the proxosomal membrane, but all of the other PEX genes and proxosome functions are normal, so that you end up um, with normal proxosomal numbers, at least in the tissues that have been looked at, and um, you are uh, defective only in the import of these three enzymes, and it's this enzyme, AGPS, that causes the plasmalogen deficiency and the disease. And at the mild end of the spectrum, when plasmalogens are near normal, we really see a disease of phytonic acid accumulation. And this is an example of a, of a young girl who just got married, uh, who um, uh, has a disease that resembles phytonic acid accumulation rather than plasmalogen deficiency. So I just want to again acknowledge uh, my physician colleagues, uh, my scientific collaborators, my lab, and in hi I've highlighted in red all the students that have been in the lab. And then as Joe had mentioned before, I'd like to acknowledge the mice, because uh, we couldn't have got, done this without them. And so the uh, PEX1 G844D mice, just as a history, um, on our side of the Atlantic, um, it was the families who founded the, um, the engineering of this mouse. It was done by, G by uh, Steve Steinberg at Kennedy Krieger. It was passed on to the Jackson Lab and it's, and it's available to everyone. And then we developed a series of PEX7 to mimic the mild, intermediate, and severe phenotypes. Um, it's the plasmalogen deficiency that really is, gives the lung defects that Joe was talking about before. So with that, I will end and pass the baton on to Bui.
this meeting, and Melissa, really, I see all the people I know already for many, many years. So, in fact, uh, Nancy already discussed everything, so <laughs> there will be some overlap, and not some, but a lot of overlap. Well, uh, following, as Nancy already uh, told you, following the, uh, its biochemical 